going back to the beginning of section 1.2, we had that statistical inference is when you take information from a sample and use that to try to say something about the entire population. To be a little more specific, really what happens is that you take a number that you can compute in the sample, which would be your statistic, and you try to use that to say something about the corresponding number in the population, which would be the parameter. So the easy way to keep these straight is the first letters of those words. So parameter goes with population, they both start with a P. Statistic goes with sample, they both start with an S. Here's that picture again from chapter one, but now it's updated to include parameters and statistics, since that's really what we're dealing with. You compute the statistic in the sample and try to use that to estimate the population parameter. Notationally, the two that are going to be the most important are the first two. Don't worry about correlation at the bottom of that table. Correlations in sections 2.5 and 2.6, so for the online course, we don't cover that until the end. In a regular semester class, it's between chapter one and chapter three. So there, that's a relevant point, but here it's not. So for now, don't worry about it. The first two we're gonna use a lot. The notation for a population mean is a lowercase Greek letter mu, which appears to be a U with a tail on the front, if you're not used to one, but that's what they look like. And the sample means notation is an X with a bar over the top, which is conventionally read as X bar. The population proportion has a notation that's just a lowercase p, and the sample proportion is denoted by a lowercase p with a caret on top, which is typically read as p hat. We're never going to estimate a standard deviation, but you're going to see both of those characters. So you're going to see that notation. The population standard deviation is denoted by a lowercase Greek letter sigma, and the sample standard deviation is denoted by a lowercase s. The one thing I want to point out with the correlation, because it might look confusing, the population correlation is denoted by a lowercase Greek letter rho, which, yes, looks a whole lot like a P. That's kind of unfortunate that there are two notations that are so close together, but for now, the correlation just won't come up for a long time. For each of those examples, what we want to do is figure out if the quantity being described is a population measure or a sample measure, and then give the correct notation. Granted, that first one is correlation, and I just said don't worry about correlation, but I think that first one is worth going through just to be able to tell if that's a sample measure or a population measure, so if it's a statistic or a parameter. That correlation is based on a sample of 2,204 high school seniors, so if it's based on a sample, it's a sample measure, so it's going to be a statistic. For completeness' sake, sample correlation is denoted by a lowercase r. Number two, the proportion of people who use an electric toothbrush using data from a sample of 300 adults. Again, data is coming from a sample, right? From a sample of 300 adults. If the data is coming from a sample, we have a sample measure. So again, it's a statistic. And more specifically, this is a sample proportion. So the correct notation is P hat. The average household income for all houses in the U.S. using data from the U.S. Census. Well, the census includes everybody. So this is a population measure. So it's a parameter. More specifically, it's a population average or population mean, so the correct notation is mu. In this example, this poll is asking a thousand registered voters, do you believe that the United States should keep the presidential election the way it is or switch to doing it via popular vote? 42% said switch, 50% said keep it, 8% said I don't know. And we have the sample proportion that wants to switch, if that's the one that we're going to focus on for right now. We've got it. It's the first thing that shows up in the table, that 42%. It's better to write that in proportion form, so that's why I've got it as a 0.42 down at the bottom. We have that, but we don't have the population proportion. That's the thing that we'd have to try to estimate. About all we could do with this right now is we could say, well, if that sample's representative of the population, then we would anticipate that the population proportion would be close to 0.42, but not necessarily that exactly, but somewhere near it. That might be a reasonable thing to say. So really what happens is that you use the 42% or 0.42 as a point estimate, where you could say, okay, it's probably close to this number, but it's probably not that exactly, which is what it says in that second bullet point. That's a good guess at an approximate value, but really what we end up with is an interval estimate. That's why this is the confidence interval chapter, rather than just the point estimate. And another thing that's worth pointing out, and this is why I have those other three polls in here, is there's variation from one sample to another. 
Just look at that first row, 42%, 54%, 52, 49. So you don't get the same thing every time. And that's because different samples contain different individuals. So you do expect to get some fluctuation, but how much fluctuation do you expect to get from one sample to another? That's really the big question here. That's the thing that we have to go after. Okay, fine. With that table that's on the previous slide, we've kind of established that sample statistics vary from one sample to another. You don't get the same thing every time. So the two big questions, which in a way are kind of the same question, if there was a way to quantify how much uncertainty surrounds the statistic, then you'd be able to get a range of plausible values for the parameter. So that's the thing that we have to do. We have to be able to quantify how much variation there is from one sample to another. And in order to do that, it sounds like we would need a lot of samples rather than just one or just a handful. That's what it says in that last bullet point. To see how statistics vary from one sample to another, we need a lot of samples, so that way we get a lot of statistics, and maybe we could quantify it. What I mean by that is what if we had something like this? So what I've got here, I specified a population proportion of 0.4, and then I took 5,000 samples of size 100. So there are a couple of things worth noting. I guess the big one is that you don't get the same thing every time. If you did, that graph would just have one bar right at the 0.4, and that would be it. It wouldn't have all of these values in here. It wouldn't have values less than 0.3. It wouldn't have values above 0.5, right? It would be the same thing over and over and over again. That's not what happens. So yeah, you get different values from different samples, sure. The other thing is, look at the shape. For one thing, it's symmetric, generally. Right? It's not obviously skewed. And the other thing is, it's a bell shape. It's not a perfect bell shape, but that's okay. Think about drawing in a best fit curve to what's here in this graph. It's gonna go like this, right? That's gonna be a bell shape. So that's an important point. It's actually in here in the notes, I think right away. Well, just about. I think we have to go forward a little bit and then it'll show up. The sampling distribution, which is what that graph is, that graph that's there in Stacky that was just up on the screen, that's the graph of a sampling distribution where if you have a whole bunch of different samples where you compute a statistic in each one, the distribution of those values, of those statistics, that's your sampling distribution. As long as you have a fixed sample size, which we did. The sample size was 100 for all 5,000 samples that were there. What the sampling distribution will tell you is that for a fixed sample size, this is how much a statistic varies from one sample to another. If you have a representative sample, or if you have a method that gives you representative samples, more specifically, if your samples were selected randomly, then the sampling distribution will be centered at the parameter, which sounds ideal, and it is. Right? You have your sample value centered around the population value. It sounds like that's the way it's supposed to work, and it is the way it's supposed to work. However, if you have a bad sampling method, like a convenience sampling method or a volunteer sampling method, then you're probably going to get biased results. You're probably going to get biased statistics. And if you have bias, generally what happens is your values are going to be consistently too high or consistently too low. And if that happens, respectively, uh, the center of your sampling distribution will be either too high or too low. The shape, which we've already seen at this point, if you have a large enough sample size, the shape of your sampling distribution will be symmetric and bell-shaped, and that's what we just saw with the samples of size 100. The natural question is what happens when your sample size isn't large enough? I have that too. Here, P is 0.4 again, but now N is 8. So sample size of 8, not very big, and look at what you get. You get something that's not symmetric. That's clearly skewed. Here's the peak right here, and the left tail only goes out this far, but the right tail goes way out here. So the right tail is longer than the left. This is right skewed. It's not symmetric. That's what happens when your sample size isn't big enough. So the main thing that we've kind of already established is we want to be able to quantify how much the statistic varies from one sample to another. That is a thing that we can do. It has a name and a thing that we can compute that measures how much variability there is from one statistic to another is something called the standard error. If I go back to stat key for a second, you can see it. Here it is. It's in the upper right corner of the graph. So this is the graph for samples of size 8. There's the standard error of 0.171. And then 
There it is here for the samples of size 100. The standard error is 0 0.048. And what the standard error is supposed to do is quantify the sampling variability. The standard error, by definition, is the standard deviation of the sample statistic. It does measure how much the statistic varies from one sample to another, and the way that you can compute it is as the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. So that's what StatKey is doing to get those numbers, to get the 0.171 and the 0.048. There is another thing worth noting, if I go back to those pictures. We're getting different standard errors. The only thing that changed was the sample size because here P is 0.4 with samples of size 100. The other graph had P equal to 0.4 with samples of size 8. Here with samples of size 100, the standard error is 0 0.048. Here with samples of size 8, the standard error is 0 0.171. That's a lot bigger. It kind of looks like what happens is that with a smaller sample, you're going to get a bigger standard error or vice versa. With a larger sample, you would get a smaller standard error. That's the idea, and that's a big point that's never going away for the rest of the course. When the sample size increases, the variability of a statistic tends to decrease, which would then imply that you get a smaller standard error. As a result, values of the statistic tend to be closer to the parameter. So, in general, bigger is better as far as the sample size goes, because with a bigger sample size, there will be less variability, so you get a smaller standard error, and ultimately, you get a more precise estimate of the parameter, which is certainly ideal.